Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here with me to celebrate the release of my new book, A Brief History of Black. I can't quite believe that it's finally here. I'm just really excited to share it with you all and share it with the world as well and for you all to be able to finally read it. Quick reminder, it is released. Dad, new you bloody phone, will you? <laughs> Okay, I might as well do that bit first. If you don't recognise my background, it's because I'm at home at my visiting some family, and I've got my dad in the room with me to go through all of the <laughs> to go through all of the live chat uh, and pull out the questions for me because it's really difficult to like read the live chat and answer questions at the same time. So he's pulling out your questions for me over there. <laughs> he didn't have his phone on silent. <laughs> started playing a video. Anyway, as a reminder, <laughs> the book is released tomorrow, Thursday the 1st of September, uh, in hardback audio and ebook versions around the world. Although no, if you are in the US and Canada, the audiobook and the ebook versions are available tomorrow, but the hardback won't be released until the 1st of November 2022. And that's just because of like longer publishing and distribution time scales because your countries are so big, essentially. <laughs> that's why. So I'm sorry that it's not available for you the hardback tomorrow. But audiobook which I've narrated myself and Kindle like the ebook version will be available anyway um so this is gonna be like a Q&A about the book black holes science history whatever you want chuck them in the chat I did also ask for questions on YouTube Twitter and Instagram uh yesterday as well and or especially on Instagram they flooded in you had so many questions so I've picked out a couple of those just to kick us off while you you know start thinking about questions and chuck them um in the chat so the first one um which I thought was quite relevant was from uh king's hook 133 uh, who asked what books target audience so it is a public science book so it's written for pretty much anybody of any science knowledge level to be able to pick it up and read it in terms of buying it for kids because i know a lot of you have asked this i'd say that any kid sort of like 13 14 and up would be absolutely fine with this obviously it's aimed at more adults necessarily it's like an adult reading level but I reckon keen kids would be absolutely fine picking up this book even younger you know if they're really really keen audio books something like that would be great for them second question um from Kasimba3 on Instagram again will it be available in stores like Target in the US or is it only online yes it will be available in stores so for example if you're in the UK Waterstones, Blackwells, WH Smiths, any of your local bookshops as well, it should be available. If they don't have it, you can request it and they'll be able to order it for you. Uh, yes, it's obviously available online as well. And the links to order that are pinned somewhere over here as well, if you want to grab it from there. In the US, as I said, the hardback, not available till the 1st of November, even though the audio and ebooks will be available online from the 1st of September. But yeah, once that hardback's available, Target, Barnes and Noble, all of the bookshops you have <laughs> over there as well, it should be available. You're around the rest of the world, again, same thing. There are German and Spanish translations in the works as well, and I'm sure there'll be more translations coming soon too if you want to wait for it to be translated into your own language as well. And then the third question I picked out was from <laughs> CDNA on YouTube, uh, Aztec Consulting on uh, Instagram, uh, Cryptoman5000 in the live chat before as well, and very many of you by email also said, are you going to be selling signed copies? Now, there are no plans in the works to sell signed copies like I did last time, where, you know, we sort of signed those book plates over the Q&A. That's, I don't have plans to do that yet. If anything changes, I'll let you know. Uh, if you are in the Oxford area of the UK, I will be doing an event at Blackwells on the 25th of October where I'll be chatting about black holes and signing some books. So come along uh, to that. There's some details on my social media like Twitter and Instagram about that if you want to check it out. Um, but as of now, as of yet, there isn't any plans to do it. But again, I will let you know if that changes. I'll put up a YouTube community post. I'll post on Twitter and Instagram if I'm going to be doing uh, any signings like last time. And I'll probably do a live as well. Let's sign them live because that's always fun, right? Uh, and then got a really nice question about her uh, from Sophie Poiser on Instagram. What is the most irritating myth that people believe about black holes, which I quite like because, I mean, pretty much the entire book is challenging people's misconceptions about black holes. So the original title for the book was White Mountains. So literally flipping the words black hole on its head, like literally the opposite of each word. Uh, and my publishers eventually decided to change it because it's not obvious from the title that the book's about black holes like if you say white mountains it's not immediately obvious um so but yeah what is the most irritating misconception i'd probably say 
but it's this idea that black holes are like hoovers they suck up everything and anything around them and it's just not the case at all like my own research is on how supermassive black holes grow because it's really freaking difficult to get them to grow in the first place to get material down to that level and for them to take it in they're just not hoovers at all I like to say I think as I say in the book like they're less like hoovers and more like couch cushions like they're just sat in your living room or your lounge just unassuming not sucking anything towards them but if you lose something down the side of those couch cushions right it's gone for good so I think that's my most biggest misconception but I also you know challenge the fact that they're not actually black and they're not actually holes either in the book a lot of other common misconceptions and also that people think Einstein came up with the idea of black holes no Einstein never considered the idea of a black hole it was ahead of sorry it was before Einstein's time and again that's the whole point of the book is to go through that history of our understanding um and then another question I like was about the book was uh, daddy warbox 90 on instagram asked how long have you been working on the book and I looked back and I had my first meeting with my agent in November 2019. We had lunch and we sort of came up with the idea of this book. So it was quite a while ago. And then through 2020, we worked on the pitch to publishers. And by March 2021, I had a deal with a publisher to publish it. And then I had to start writing it. And I was probably writing it from around June 2021 to December 2021 it really geared up towards the end of the year as well I, if people remember I did a trip to Cambridge last September where I was writing frantically a lot of stuff that was that was basically where I wrote the book the book so right I can guess I can see the live chat's going crazy so you know what let's take some questions from the live chat my dad's written a load down bless him he didn't want to nobody in my family apparently likes to be on camera or to be or to like be heard on camera so I'm getting them written down <laughs> real question uh so okay so first one uh, Hank Meyer asked, how do we know that singularities exist and it's not just neutron stars, like more massive neutron stars with an event horizon? We don't, essentially. The event horizon means that we can't see anything beyond that. Like it is beyond our powers of observation is often the phrase that's parroted. So yeah, there could be something inside the event horizon. So some exotic form of matter that we just don't, know about that we don't know that that exists rather than everything being crushed down into a singularity i.e all the matter crushed into an infinitely small infinitely dense place that's the mathematical description of it but does that mean it's the physical description of it no and under the current laws of physics we probably never will know uh, there's another question here from sean d he says how do black holes evaporate does it have to do with virtual particles at the event horizon? Evaporating black holes, you went straight to the difficult bit. In fact, it's actually the last chapter in the book before the epilogue is all about hawking radiation and the evaporation of black holes. And yes, it does have to do with sort of uh, the quantum vacuum and virtual particles and all this kind of stuff. And it's explained much more coherently in the book than I could do it right now on a live stream. Um, but essentially, yes, black holes do evaporate thanks to hawking radiation. And... Everyone always confuses this with um, like jets or outflows from black holes. That's very different because that's just from the very turbulent regions around the black hole. Whereas evaporation from the black hole is actual energy and radiation from the black hole itself. Very strange, very hypothetical concept. We've never detected the idea, this idea of Hawking radiation, this energy being given off, but it would happen slowly. Like the probability of having it is so, so low that for even like a, like a black hole formed in a supernova, it would be, you know, I think it's, I think it's over billions of years. I don't think it's even hundreds of billions of years. I think it's like, you know, trillions, if not longer, you know, getting onto like a Google kind of thing, length of time. So it's an incredibly, incredibly long length of time. What else you got for me, Dan? Thank you. Um, is that a Z? I can't, I can't read you right in Lazar. What is it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is the deal with spinning and non-spinning black holes? So there's, again, this comes back down to the maths. So how you describe a black hole in terms of general relativity, the black hole can be spinning or not spinning. And that changes the math. Essentially, it changes how space time is curved around the black hole in terms of general relativity describing the gravity. So 
Uh, if a black hole is spinning, we call that a Kerr black hole because of the uh, astronomer, New Zealand astronomer that figured, or astrophysicist that figured out the maths behind that Roy Kerr. Um, and then a non-spinning black hole is probably not something that's quite physical. You're not likely to have a black hole that's not spinning. So if you think about like how black holes form from stars, stars spin, everything has angular momentum. Even when they collapse down, the black hole is still going to be spinning. And even if you have something like a primordial black hole that formed from like gas in the very early universe you're likely to have some angular momentum some sort of rotation energy in that gas anyway so you always like to end up with a black hole that is spinning but also as that black hole takes on more material that material is going to have angular momentum and that's also going to what we say spin up the black hole as well and give it a higher angular momentum so always tend to have spinning black holes in terms of a physical sense but mathematically you can describe both Ooh, 13 IV13 says, did you have to study computer science to become an astrophysicist? No, uh, no, I didn't. So there was a part of my university course, so my undergraduate course, that was learning how to code in the language Python, which was very important. I didn't think it was important at the time. I was like, oh, I hate this. <laughs> now I love it. Um, and I didn't really understand why we were doing it. But literally everything I do, analysis of data, processing of data, making graphs, making diagrams, it's all done with code. Just the amount of data you have, you couldn't do it with something like Excel. You have to do it with code. Um, and, and also if you're going to model anything as well, it's all to do with code. So didn't have to study computer science. I don't know how, I don't need to know how a computer works to use it as a tool in the same way you don't need to know how a computer works to use something like Excel as well, right? It's the same thing. That's what computer science is. It's learning sort of the ins and outs of how all this happens. But in terms of like using the tools like you can learn to code yourself online with various different websites and stuff. So if you do want to be a scientist, if you're a budding scientist, that's always my one piece of advice is to learn to code. Ooh, Clive asks, is anything that has been recently discovered by JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, um, that you would have included in the book if you could? Yes, I would have done. So if you remember the first science images, my favorite was Stefan's Quintet, those five galaxies, four of which are interacting in the background and one in the foreground. And one of them has, it in, if you look at the Miri image, which is the longer wavelengths from, from the James Webb Space Telescope, that is showing sort of this bright, bright point source in the middle of that galaxy, which is essentially the gas that's spiraling around the black hole, shining incredibly brightly in the infrared. And I think I definitely, there's a chapter why black holes are not black it's called um there's also one uh called supermassive size me which is all about supermassive black holes as well um which i definitely would have included the fact that we can see that with jwst and also the fact that even in the deep field images with jwst you can see these bright point sources so you know that very distinctive shape you get from jwst images of the like crosshair the eight pointed star it's very different from just the hubble one which is four pointed you, they're so so bright even in background image in background galaxies that are like in those deep field images that even in distant galaxies you can pick out the fact that it's got a bright point source in the center which is the gas spiraling around a supermassive black hole so I definitely would have put that in the book uh if I could this just reminded me how pretty is this book cover by the way like I literally they came to me my publishers and were like do you have any ideas or thoughts for the book cover and I was literally like make it pretty and make it shiny <laughs> those were like my two stipulation so I love the fact that it's shining like I'm just a little magpie it's also embossed as well the text which is, oh, it's really really nice it's really nice so I hope when you guys get your copies uh you like it too um because all I wanted to be was pretty so hopefully it'll stand out from all the other space packs that are just like space books that are just like boring and black uh, anyway uh do -do 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 -do. Uh, Emil McKellar asks, is there a minimum mass that does not affect space-time as defined by Einstein? Or does the strong electromagnetic force influence density to prevent micro black holes from forming? Um, no, I don't think there is a minimum mass that doesn't affect space. I think even a single atom will cause some sort of curvature. That's why you can get this idea of a primordial black hole that's still a hypothetical idea. It's something that Hawking and Penrose worked on in their time as well, was this idea that black holes could form from just tiny, tiny clumps of atoms and molecules in the very early universe, and they could still be hanging around today as well. And they could have any mass essentially you know down to like 10 to the minus whatever kilograms so there's no minimum mass necessarily what else you got for me what you're picking out Dad? should i be like going from the top down or the bottom let's go to the bottom all right chris adams asks when two black holes collide 
Can they tear each other apart or will they always merge whilst maintaining a spherical shape and without releasing any matter? So no, they can't necessarily tear each other apart. The gravity will hold them together. However, the gravitational forces involved will probably warp what you'd call the, the event horizon. So this spherical shape is just the event horizon around the outside. So I think that would necessarily warp as they finally merge. Like you get some sort of dumbbell shape, I think is what you essentially get. And then they merge and it sort of settles down back into something spherical. And without releasing any matter is an interesting statement question because when two black holes merge, like if you take, I don't know, say an 80 times the mass of the sun black hole merges with a 60 times the mass of the sun black hole, you don't necessarily get something that's 140 times the mass of the sun. You get something that's probably more like 135 times the mass of the sun because that spare extra five times the mass of the sun mass has actually been converted to energy and radiated away as these gravitational waves these waves that sort of ripple through space-time itself from the sort of bending of space like to the extreme and back as the two black holes orbit each other. It's sort of almost like radiated away and, and that's how we then, you know, detect that these black holes have merged uh, thanks to gravitational waves. So technically do release matter, but as energy, I guess. <laughs> Lots of people. <laughs> how do you become an astrophysicist? Okay, so... Uh, all the way from school level, you need to start picking science and maths subjects. So, for example, if you're in the UK, for your A-levels, physics, maths, super important. Obviously, I know in the US system it's slightly different, but keep physics and maths as long as you can. Um, and then when you go to university, you should be doing either physics, maths, or engineering. So if you know you want to be an astrophysicist straight off, you can apply for physics with astrophysics. So you or basically all just get to pick all the astrophysics and astronomy modules. Um, if you don't know straight away and you want to give yourself a bit of freedom, physics, maths, or engineering are usually the prerequisite undergraduate university degrees to do a PhD, which is essentially the degree that allows you to call yourself doctor at the end. It's in the UK, it's about four years. In the US, other places, it's a little bit longer, like five to seven. Four years of solid research on a topic that essentially makes you an expert in that topic because you're answering questions that no one's answered before it's like independent brand new research once you've done your phd i think at that point well probably when i was doing my phd i would say i was an astrophysicist i was still obviously in training if you will um but after that then you can call yourself an astrophysicist you can start applying for jobs at universities or space agencies where you're doing research and astrophysics as a job so essentially if you're in school right now make sure you pick uh, physics and maths. If you go into university, pick physics and maths, and then you want to do a PhD, in which case you can do a PhD in astrophysics. And essentially, all you need to do is just show that you're really passionate about the subject to get into university and stuff like that. By, you know, maybe there's an astronomy society near you that you can join, stuff like that. All right. Oh, there's even more coming in. This is great. Um, I hope everyone's having fun, by the way. Thanks for being here with me. I really appreciate it. Um, Christy Parker, if it's not like a hoover, then how does it suck in light? So the escape velocity of the black hole is greater than the speed of light. So that's the speed you would need to be traveling at to escape the pull of the black hole's gravity. Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. And I go into why in the book, there's a video on it somewhere on my channel as well, um, which means that if light gets too close, then it will be lost forever. So you can think of them like prisons of light. But that the key word there is if it gets too close. It won't suck it in from a distance and trap it there. It's only if it gets too close. So in that sense, it's you know it's not really a hoover. Uh, Bill Harm? Yeah. For real. Can't read my dad's own writing. <laughs> I've heard the argument that nothing falls into a black hole because time stops at the event horizon. Can you comment? That is only to an observer. So instead of general relativity, which is Einstein's theory of gravity around black hole, we're now talking about special relativity, which is Einstein's theory about space and time. So you might have heard of the idea of length contraction and time dilation. So in very high, so very high speeds, you get time dilation. So the faster you're going, the less time you experience. But also at very high gravity, you also experience time dilation. 
So for someone who, and I go into all of this in the book, like literally what would happen if you fell into a black hole? What would someone else see watching it? What would you see if you were in some sort of spaghettification proof spacecraft so you wouldn't get torn apart by the forces of gravity? What would happen? And essentially to an observer, they never see you cross the event horizon because light takes longer and longer and longer to get to them because of the effects of time dilation due to the very strong gravity. But for someone who's actually falling in towards the black hole, you would happily cross the event horizon. In fact, you probably not even notice that you had. You weren't really paying attention either. So time does not stop there. It's just to an observer. That's what they see. Again, more detail in the book if you want to know more about that. Um, ba -da -da -da. Carl Street, black holes are the ultimate gravity machine. Where does the gravity come from? Like with anything else, gravity comes from the amount of mass or matter that's contained in one place. Now you could ask, okay, well, what makes matter heavy? That's all to do with the Higgs boson, which is getting into particle physics. I did make uh, a video about the Higgs boson once. I actually visited CERN back in February, 2020, before, you know, the world went a bit crazy uh, and travel all stopped. I managed to sneak in a trip. And um, uh, yeah, talked about the Higgs boson and, and the theory behind that, if you want to check that video out. But essentially the gravity comes from the fact that there is so much matter contained in one place that it curves space. So anything traveling on that space won't go in a straight line anymore. It'll curve around it, might maybe even curve and spiral all the way down to become part of the black hole. Okay. Ooh, okay. Uh, Rezi asks, where is and how far is the nearest black hole? So I talk about this in the book, where is our nearest black hole? And there is one that's definitely confirmed that's called, oh, I don't remember the numbers before it, but it's in the constellation of Monocerotis, which is a fun word to say. I joke that it sounds like a disease in the book. Um, and that's actually a stellar mass black hole. So it's come from a supernova a couple of hundred light years away or so. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but it's actually a black hole that we've sent signals towards. So the European Space Agency sent a message on Stephen Hawking's birthday uh, towards that black hole as well, sort of in his honor, which is quite cool. But it might not be the closest one because there is currently a discussion about whether there is an extra planet in the solar system right on the edges which might be a black hole because we haven't found it yet so that could explain why we haven't found it if it was a black hole which would be really fun if it was like it would be a, a one of these primordial black holes that would be like 10 to 20 times the mass of earth rather than the mass of the sun it'd be like about the size of a tennis ball as well and i would love it if the solar system just had this little pet black hole there's also other reasons why you might think it's a black hole as well and again i go into that in the book it's in chapter nine and i cannot tell you how happy i was to make chapter nine about planet nine and whether it could be a black hole it's actually one of my favorite chapters to write, I think, because like if you want to introduce the concept of could, could there be another planet on the edge of the solar system, people would be like, well, what about Pluto? Because that almost was what spurred the search originally was the weirdness to Neptune's orbit, and then they discovered Pluto. So I go into the history of you know why that was the case, the search for Pluto, who found Pluto, and all of the, the human computers involved at the observatory doing that as well. Uh, the naming of Pluto, and then the de like the the realization that Pluto wasn't as big as we thought, the demotion of Pluto, and then eventually to this idea that a planet nine could be a black hole instead. So, yeah, good fun. Do, 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 do. Uh, Rezi again says, could jets from our galaxy's black hole cause an extinction event? Good question. So I think I covered this in a video actually about, you know, this idea of a, a Goldilocks like habitable zone uh, around a star for planets. We think that also might be a galactic habitable zone as well. Like almost like the distance from a black hole you are in a galaxy, like the distance from a supermassive black hole in the very center, like how far out you are. The sun and the solar system is kind of out on the suburbs of the Milky Way. It's not quite on the outer edge, but sort of in the middle. Again, you won't be on the outer edge because like high energy radiation from, you know, intergalactic space. And then if there was one of these big burps of energy from the regions surrounding a black hole that can get very turbulent, um, obviously that would impact probably more in the center as well. So again, you wouldn't want to be close to the center. Our Milky Way's black hole, Sagittarius A star as it's called, um, is very quiet. It is not very active at all. It's not really growing at all at the moment. It's not, you know, got material spiraling around it that much. So um, we actually sort of think that that might be one of the reasons why life could have started uh, on this planet as well because we were in a very habitable galaxy and that, that could be one of the stipulations for you know when we when we've looked for other planets as well could we find them you know if we could ever look for 
extra galactic planets? Like, would it be good to look for them in galaxies that have active black holes or don't have active black holes as well? Which would be quite cool. Uh, Gowrie Shankar asks, is it possible to create a black hole in a particle collider? Technically, it would be possible to create one of those primordial black holes I was talking about before. They're completely theoretical still. We've never actually observed one. These are the things that Hawking really sort of worked on the theory of in the 60s, uh, where you just have like tiny, you know, clumps of like atoms, molecules forming what would become dense enough to be classed as a black hole. Um, that sort of doomsday thing that was covered in the media where it was like, create a black hole and it would grow and everything would get sucked into it is that it was complete tosh. That was a fun word I told you what Americans last week as well. Uh, let's see what else have we got here. Uh, if light does not have mass, how does it get trapped in a black hole? That was from Cherry. Well, it doesn't have mass, but it still has a set speed limit. And so because light can't travel any faster than that speed limit, which is greater, which is less than what you would need to escape the black hole, it still can't escape a black hole. And it all comes down to why light has that set speed limit. And again, I go that into that in the book. It's ex essentially, this is what Einstein explained in all his theories of relativity as well. Why was this maximum speed to the speed of light uh, in a vacuum? So that's the reason why, even though it doesn't have any mass, it still has this set speed limit. It's actually a really nice uh, graph. <laughs> So, you know, as scientists, we love a graph as well um, that sort of explains that. At least I think it explains it very beautifully, whether it'll help other people. Obviously, the text goes into it in loads of detail as well. But I want to give a shout out to the graph because it was my sister who did all of the diagrams uh, in the book as well. So all the diagrams you see throughout the book to help you understand, know that that was all my sister's work. She is a graphic designer. Uh, she also designed my recent merch, you know, with all the, the really nice like JDRST images as well. So, you know, my sister Megan, we obviously love her, but we love her extra for, <laughs> for doing all of that too. And I was really excited to have her involved with the book as well. Uh, Paul Carter asks, black holes are three dimensional. Like what's on the other side and will we ever see? Yeah. So this is actually another one of those common misconceptions about black holes is that them being a hole people picture it like a well and there's almost like the bottom of the well. So there's no other side, but a black hole is three dimensional. They start life as stars, or at least in the only process that we know can create a black hole, you know, is the death of a star in a supernova. They start life as a star. So, you know, like the sun, well, not like the sun because the black hole won't become a black hole, but something like 10 times bigger than the sun, 10 times more massive than the sun, it will collapse down into a black hole. So you started with something 3D, if you compress that with gravity on all sides, you're going to get something that's three dimensional, right? The event horizon essentially is this sphere surrounding the black hole where we no longer get any light or information from. And that's sort of what we class as the size of the black hole as well. It's obviously a common question I get is that event horizon. So it's called the Schwarzschild radius. If you want to Google Schwarzschild radius, you'll actually find the equation that tells you how to work out how big a black hole of a certain mass would be. You can work it out for, you know, a human, which I do that calculation in the book as well. If you're like an average human of 62 kilograms, what size of a black hole uh, do you get? Um, I think that's always a fun calculation um, to do. So there is no other side of a black hole. That's like saying what's on the other side of the moon. You could just go and find out. I think how people get confused is they confuse wormholes with black holes. So a black hole is fully like a a dark star, right? This star that's been crushed down and it's just something that's very, very incredibly heavy. A wormhole is this idea that, you know, you could have a hole, a literal hole on either side of space and they would connect each other. Um, and the two are described similarly mathematically, but obviously there's no singularity involved um, with a wormhole. Otherwise you wouldn't ever be able to escape once you went through the hole and you wouldn't be able to come out the other side. So interesting question. I like that one. All right. Um... Okay, uh, Yanni Wolf asks, are there any particular sections of the book that you especially enjoyed writing? Um, let's have a think. So, well, I said, my video that comes out tomorrow, I say this as well, um, the footnotes. <laughs> there are 113 footnotes in this book, which my publishers were like, that is a lot. I don't know if you realize that. Um, the footnotes are almost like, like I'm writing it and it's all, you know, very like, yes, we're going through the science, and the, the history and et cetera, et cetera. And the footnotes and then just me being like, and guess what? Like, do you know this? This is almost like a running commentary of like what's in my brain at the time. So those are obviously really fun to write. Um, I particularly enjoyed a lot of the chapters that really went into the history of how we know something. Because I think a lot of stuff, you know, science communication that's done, a lot of documentaries you see, it's all about 
this is what we know. And that was used to bug me as a kid because I used to be like, yeah, but how do we know that? Like who figured that out? And so I made sure with this book to go into that so much about how we know something, who figured it out? Because I think it really helps people to understand, you know, why certain ideas were um, let go and sort of like, actually, no, that's not going to be right, is it? And why we think the things that we do now are not those things. We've already thought about them in this show that that wasn't the case and stuff like that. So I really enjoyed those chapters where I went into the history. So there was a lot of stuff I learned in this as well, especially about the people who did various different things as well and when it was done. So yeah, I, I really enjoyed going into the history, especially like there's a chapter on the history of like the LIGO experiment and how that even started. Like the history of that goes back to the 1960s, like them trying to get that off the ground. And that was something that came online in like the mid 2010s. Like that's insane if you think about it, how long it took to get that experiment off the ground. So yeah, a lot of the history, I, I really enjoyed diving into that because uh, I learned a lot as well. So, all right. Um, ooh, uh, Wayward Rush, well, sorry, Wayward Rush asks, can you have a galaxy without a black hole at the center or is it a requirement? Our current understanding is that all galaxies have a black hole at the center. However, that might not be the case. And there are some arguments that perhaps there are some dwarf galaxies that don't have a, a black hole at the center. However, all the ones that we've seen seem to have a rotation pattern of stars that suggest, yes, there is a mass in the center. There would be a supermassive black hole. It probably all comes down to like how they're formed in the early universe. So we still don't know whether the galaxy of stars forms first. One of those stars goes supernova, makes a black hole that grows from there to become supermassive. And obviously it's the heaviest thing. So it sort of ends up in the center of the galaxy. Or if in the early universe, like a gas cloud collapses down into a black hole, then that starts to shepherd all the other gas around it. And the stars form from the gas around it. And you get this galaxy of stars forming. I talked about that in my first book, sort of like an astrophysics chicken or the egg question about whether um, the galaxy of the black hole form first. And I touch on it in this book too, about, you know, if we can learn about that, for example, with JWST, which has been designed to see back to the very early universe, it's one of the questions I hope it's going to answer then maybe we'll know like which one comes first. And therefore we should know if it's then possible for to get a galaxy without a supermassive black hole. Because if the supermassive black hole films first and the galaxy around it, then you're never going to get a galaxy without a supermassive black hole in the center. But if the galaxy forms first, then technically you could have something without a central supermassive black hole. Uh, okay. Um, Majid Debbie asks, is, apologies if I just butchered your name. You know what I'm like with words. Space is hard. Words are harder. Um, <laughs> Majid asks, is there any relation between black holes and dark matter? Yes and no. So dark matter is obviously anything that doesn't interact with light. It doesn't absorb light. It doesn't give off light. It doesn't reflect light, anything like that. A black hole, you could probably say, well, that absorbs light, so it does interact with light. So there is a sort of aspect of dark matter that you could say, okay, but it's still stuff that we can't see in a galaxy. So you do have to account for that if you're thinking about visible versus dark matter. And when originally people in the 70s and 80s were thinking about dark matter, that was raised as a possibility that there could be a lot of black holes, neutron stars, even rogue planets that we just can't see in the galaxy that could account for it all. But essentially, when people do all the calculations and estimates about how many of these things there should be in the galaxy, it's not enough to account for the amount of dark matter that we think is there when we compare how heavy something is, that general relativity is telling us how heavy something is with how much like light that we're seeing there that could be coming from X number of stars. There's also the question of whether, the, okay, if dark matter isn't black holes, then there is uh, some hypothesis out there that there could be these primordial black holes as well these tiny black holes that formed in the early universe could account for dark matter again still a hypothesis nothing that's been confirmed yet sort of some evidence that supports some evidence that doesn't and then there's also the idea well okay if the dark matter is then like a particle we've got all the particle physicists looking for it come on guys we're still waiting <laughs> well if it's a particle could then a black hole grow by taking in dark matter and again that's something i think i covered uh, in a previous video on this channel as well i think i covered both can dark matter be made of black holes and can black holes be made of dark matter as well so there might be some link there but we currently our best hypothesis is that it is actually some form of exotic particle that we don't know yet uh, and that's probably more likely so let's get some more questions uh Amaratia uh, Wagmer asks, does light accelerate around a black hole? 
Um, accelerate, no. If it's a vacuum, then it'll be traveling at the speed of light in a vacuum anyway. Nothing can go faster than the speed of light, so you can't really accelerate faster than the speed limit, and therefore probably not. Uh, obviously, if it's going through some other medium, then maybe, but what other medium would it probably be going through? Uh, Sergey asks, what are your thoughts on the theory of white holes? Did you consider it in your book? I didn't actually, I think I briefly mentioned it in the book, but I didn't go into it in great detail. Because mainly because white holes are still hypothetical things. They're completely theor like, theor like theoretical from the maths. They're not something we've ever observed. Obviously, I'm an observer, so I focus on sort of like the theoretical predictions that you know we then observe and the things we observe to tell us what we know now in terms of the history. Um so I didn't really go into white holes in the book, but I have made a video on this channel before about whether like the big like the big bang, like as in like sort of the time equals zero sort of initial stages of the universe could have been a white hole necessarily. This idea of the opposite of a black hole where like you wouldn't be prisons for light. It would literally be just like light being given off, energy and matter almost coming out of a singularity instead. Um, they are still completely hypothetical and obviously the maths describes them, but we've never seen anything like that. And obviously you would think if there was this great big thing in the universe that was producing loads of light and energy and matter out of singularity, would we would have found it by now. So Doo -doo -doo. Andy asks, what is gravity? Can it be seen? And is it a physical thing? I mean, it's a great question. Like, what is gravity? Like, we, how would you answer that? You could say, oh, it's the force that keeps us here on Earth. I guess you could say that. Um, it's the force that, you know, keeps you trapped on objects. It's not really a force at all, though, either, really, is it? Because it's sort of, like, relative to an observer. So, I mean, Einstein described it as matter curving space and as all sort of traveling along the space that that matter is caused to curve. Can it be seen is an interesting question because, yes, technically it can. So even in the most recent um, or one of the big five sort of images that were released by the James Webb Space Telescope, you see around that sort of central big galaxy cluster, all of these arcs, these sort of like big sort of smears of light. That is background galaxy light that's traveled through that cluster and sort of been bent, almost like, you know, sort of like light through a, like a, a, the, the a bottom of a wine of a stemmed wine glass essentially like if you move that in front of a candle you see what I mean about you sort of distort the light really there you're seeing sort of gravity in action I guess um in the same way that you know apple falls from a tree you're, you're seeing gravity I think people find that uh, you know quite a strange concept but at the same time like you can't see magnetism but you can see, like, if you have a big thing of iron filings and drop a bar magnet on it, you'll see them all move and move along the magnetic field lines. So in that respect, like, no, you can't see magnetism, but you can see the effects of it. I think it's the same thing for gravity. But it is a physical thing, obviously, because it, I mean, it describes the physical universe. We wouldn't be here without gravity. So, uh, Gauri Shankar, is there any evidence of dark matter in our solar system? Good question. I mean, the assumption is that dark matter, there is some given density across the galaxy. And I think it would be something like there's two hydrogen atoms of mass worth of dark matter in every teaspoon of space in the solar system is the assumption. But evidence of dark matter existing there um, in terms of like, have we detected it? No, because obviously if we detected some dark matter directly like that, we'd be shouting from the rooftops. Um, in terms of its influence on other things, I don't think so either. Um, but it's interesting to think, especially if like Planet Nine turns out to be a black hole, then there could be some concentration of dark matter around there. Also antimatter as well, which would probably, um, which would annihilate with normal matter and then you'd be able to perhaps detect that the black hole was there. So yeah, it's definitely an interesting question, but I don't think any there's any evidence of of like dark matter being found in the solar system. Uh, Cherry asks, does a singularity spin? Interesting question. I mean, when you say a spinning black hole, yes, you're describing the singularity. It's the singularity that does the curving of space. So yes, if a black hole is spinning, then mathematically the singularity is also spinning as well. Um, obviously, um, it comes back to the idea of like, is a black hole truly a singularity? Or if you look inside the event horizon, is it some other exotic form of matter? In which case the question is moot, right? It wasn't even a singularity um, in the first place. So um, yeah, I think that's how I'd answer that question. I'm just checking if I wrote down some other questions from like Instagram or YouTube from before. 
Um, no, I think we've answered them all, actually, which is fun. Oh, there was one from Ginger Hulk on Insta that asked, in what way was writing this book more difficult than writing scientific papers, which I thought was a great question. Um, it's very, very different. I actually find writing very hard. Um, I've actually had to sort of like learn that when you have a blank page, it's okay for words to come out as just train of thought word vomit. <laughs> That's how I can describe it. With scientific papers, I find that very difficult because obviously they have to be in almost like this perfect scientific prose that, you know, sounds so intelligent straight away. And that's just not how my thoughts come out. You can probably tell from this live stream, like that's not how my brain works at all. So in that sense, like writing this book was almost easier because it's written as if you're having just a chat with me about black holes, right? That's the whole point of a public science book. So almost like that, almost like spoken sort of narrative that's sort of familiar from watching my YouTube videos will be familiar in the book. But obviously when you're writing a scientific paper, there's almost more redrafts to go from word vomit to beautiful scientific prose at the end of it. So in that respect, it was almost easier, I found, than writing scientific papers. I was about to say I had to look up more for that book, but to be honest, I think it was probably similar as well. No, I have to look up more for writing scientific papers. I have to look up references more and more and more. Um, but it was interesting sort of like finding sources for that on the history and everything like that as well. And that I think was a really fun aspect uh, of writing that too. Um, but yeah, very, very different. And so, you know, I got told I was a bad writer at school. I've, you know, written books and written scientific papers. I think it matters what you're writing about if you enjoy it. Um, and if you enjoy the topic that you're writing about, then um, yeah, you're golden basically. So well, it's been about 40 minutes. I feel like I've kept you all for quite a while. <laughs> I've kept some of you from um, the tennis, the US Open. So sorry about that. <laughs> That's from my moment. She's watching more isn't she? Um, but thank you all for being here. My book tomorrow, which is amazing. I'm so excited for you all to read it. I know some of you internationally might have already, already got your copy as well, which is very exciting. Um, I would be absolutely thrilled if you read it. And you wanted to post a review, you know, from wherever you bought it, whether that's online somewhere or if you bought it from a store, then perhaps maybe on Goodreads as well. I'd love to know what you all think. Um, when your copy arrives, like send me a picture as well of you just being like, yeah, it's all right, it's here. I'd love, love to see it. Tag me, check it on social media as well. Um, yeah, I just, I just love to hear what you guys think and um, hope, I really, really hope that you enjoy it. You got the audiobook. I hope you just hear me whittering away in your ear wherever you're going, if you're driving or walking or whatever it might be. And um, yeah, I just want to say a massive, massive thank you for all of your support as well. Um, I really appreciate it. And thanks for watching my videos. Thanks for buying my book. <laughs> thanks for buying my merch as well. And um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, all of you. And um, until I see you next, happy stargazing, everybody. Bye. <laughs> say bye, Dad. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>